can have Megan Peters here with us. Uh, Megan is an assistant professor of cognitive sciences at UC Irvine. She's also a CIFAR fellow in the program of Brain, Mind, and Consciousness. And she's also one of the principal investigators in an adversarial collaboration to test the predictions of first order and higher order theories of consciousness. Um, so welcome, Megan. We're very happy to have you here today talking about this topic. Thank you. Um, and, and I understand that I'm competing with a with dance party and pyramids. And so it sounds like um, I'm going to have to try to entertain you guys with, with some PowerPoint here. But um, uh, please bear with me. Uh, and thank you very much for, for letting me zoom in. Um, I wish I could be there in person. It sounds like you guys are all having a blast. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is mostly uh, mostly the adversarial collaboration. Um, that is designed to specifically put pressure on first order and higher order theories of consciousness. I know you've heard a little bit about some of these theories, but I will start with an overview. So again, please forgive me if this is some stuff that you have heard before. Um, okay, you all should see nothing but slides, is that correct? <coughs> Great, okay. Um, yeah, uh, so um, the most of the work that I'm gonna talk about today is done with a large group of collaborators. And so you will see uh, many of their smiling faces and their names throughout this talk. So um, that, that I say that getting to stress that um, this, <clears throat> this type of science that we're doing is, is difficult and it's really uh, important that we try to do it right. There's, as you all know, consciousness science is a difficult field. Uh, there's there's a lot of um, unlike maybe I don't know oceanography or uh, climate well climate science maybe has has its own share of of loonies on the on the edges but consciousness science tends to attract uh, people um, from the general public who uh, who may not have the background and the resources to to do it uh, in a way that is scientifically sound and uh, theoretically motivated. You know, you get people who are like, well, let's study telepathy instead. And, and that, you know, that counts as consciousness science, right? So I think that some of the work that I'm going to present today, the, the sheer volume of, of like the people involved and, and the work that we're doing um, is, is testament to this push towards wanting to do consciousness science in an increasingly rigorous fashion. And I find that really exciting. Um, I'm really happy to be part of uh, this, um, this growing initiative to really push at the edges of what we can do scientifically when our target is consciousness and not one of the more traditional fields like memory or attention or decision making. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's start by talking, uh, taking a very big broad view. And of course, this is largely maybe too broad for the crowd here. Um, but I'd like to start with this slide because it highlights the relationship uh, between what um, what kind of everybody is studying when they're trying to study the conscious or trying to study the brain, um, and uh, and what we can do as consciousness science scientists to piggyback on that to kind of grow with uh, to to stand on the shoulders of giants so to speak. So one of the things about brains that I find most fascinating is that brains discover uh, statistical regularities and they they use them to drive adaptive goal directed behavior and this property that has been evolutionarily optimized over millennia is why we're still here. We're really good at picking out patterns in the world. We're really good at exploiting those patterns. And one of the ways that I think helps us be particularly good at picking out and exploiting these patterns is that we can also monitor ourselves while we are doing this. So we have a, capa a metacognitive capacity to know when we're doing a good job to know when we need to update some sort of ongoing internal model that we have of the world. <clears throat> uh, and, and it, um, yeah, and so we can use this uncertainty to effectively update our internal models and then move around and engage adaptively. And one of the pieces that seems, um, you know, that is relevant to, to this crowd, but I think that is intimately tied to this self-monitoring capacity is the fact that we are phenomenally aware. Um, and so, assumedly, all of you are also phenomenally aware, and it kind of suggests that there is some functional advantage, some evolutionary advantage to the fact that there is something that it is like for us to be conscious. So, one of the core questions that I ask in my research is, you all are conscious, I am conscious, how is it that we become conscious? <laughs> and of course, as you are well aware, 
I am not the only person asking these questions. Uh, in fact, I am only one in a long line of people who have been asking these questions for a very, very long time. And the number of theories continues to proliferate. And the number of people who have their pet theory and want to go and try to prove that their pet theory is correct continues to proliferate. Um, there was this uh, really interesting uh, paper that, that came out just recently, uh, maybe last year, um, by Liad Mudrick and colleagues, and I don't know, Liad also gave a, a keynote at the at the workshop, is that right? No? Okay. Um, well, anyway, you should go and check this out because she did this massive overview study uh, where she looked at, in the entire literature, uh, how many papers there are um, testing each of these theories and whether they're trying to confirm the theory or whether they're trying to refute the theory. And the results are exactly as you would expect, that lots of people like to test their own theory and try to prove that it's right, and very few people try to, to pick out another theory and show how it's wrong. Um, but there is a specific initiative from the Templeton World Charity Foundation, which I think you all have heard of now, which is this adversarial collaboration project, which is the idea, like the Thunderdome of, uh, of science advances, where two theories enter the room and they fight it out and one theory is supposed to leave victorious. Um, and so the project that I'll be mostly telling you about today um, is uh, one <clears throat> that I'm involved in testing specifically at the uh, at the point the points of tension, the points of intersection between local recurrency theories of consciousness and higher order theories of consciousness. Um, and so this is a large collaboration. Um, I'm only showing you pictures from the team that is working on, on uh, experiment one, as we call it. There is an entire other experiment two that is led by Biu and Jan, and they have a whole team. Uh, Ned and Dave are the theory leaders, and they have a whole team. And then we have, uh, sorry, these are the, the theory advisors for the project. Then we have the theory leaders. So we have Richard Brown and Hakwan Lau from uh, the, the higher order camp. We have Victor from the first order camp. And then we also have an entire army of research assistants and additional uh, personnel who are making this project a success. Um, so I really want to highlight the uh, enormous effort that all of these folks have put in, um, and it's been truly a pleasure, pleasure to get to work with all of them. Uh, and, and so the, the name of our project is an adversarial collaboration to test predictions of first order and higher order theories of consciousness. And so even though <clears throat> I know that you all have seen some, uh, some talks about first order and higher order theories so far, throughout the, the school. Um, I just wanted to anchor us and make sure that we're all on the same page about what this means. So uh, local recurrency theories or first order theories um, <clears throat> posit that first order representations um, being patterns of neural responses, typically in sensory brain regions. Um, normally these are the ones that uh, encode an internal representation of some property out there in the world. So the definition of first order is that it is about the thing that's out there physically, um, or and that the inference process maybe that, it, that your brain undertakes is about a physical property of the world. And so the assertion of these first order theories is that um, the first order representations uh, is sufficient, necessary and sufficient for the per person to be phenomenally conscious of the represented property. Uh, for example, a signal in the auditory cortex that appropriately encodes the sound of a tuning fork is sufficient for the person to be phenomenally conscious of that sound. And local recurrency theories put an additional component on top of this, that it is the specifically the local recurrencies in these first order areas that is responsible for the presence and strength of the phenomenal percept. Okay, so we're gonna contrast that with higher order theories just very briefly. Um, so in contrast to first order representations, higher order representations are about our own internal mental processes. So you can think of first order as being about the internal world. You then have a first order representation, and then you have a higher order representation about that first order representation. And you don't necessarily only need one higher order versus first order, but this is a category, like you could have, you know, nested higher order about higher order and so on. But this is a categorical distinction because the target of the, say, inference process that your brain is trying to, to uh, engage in is about the, inter the external world or about internal processes. And that's for first order versus higher order respectively. Okay. Um, and so the assertion from higher order theories is that higher order uh, representations about first order representations are necessary 
for phenomenal consciousness. The first order can't do all the work by itself. You need something else on top of that. Um, and so you need um, a higher order representation of or about a first order representation of a physical sound in order to become phenomenally aware. And the specific type of higher order representation or nature of that higher order representation that is required um, in order for you to become phenomenally aware uh, differs from by, by different flavors of higher order theory. Um, and we're, we're working on an, another proposal for one of these other uh, adversarial collaborations um, that will actually try to draw distinctions between higher order theories as well. So, um, you know, hopefully stay tuned for that and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes as well. Okay, so this is the background in terms of the theory, but uh, I then wanted to give you a flavor of the background in terms of the types of experimental manipulations that we will be doing and that we are doing um, and, and why we chose these, where they came from, why we think this is a particularly good test of different predictions between higher order and, and first order or local recurrency theories. And the particular uh, workhorse that we will be using uh, is this phenomenon called subjective inflation uh, in the visual periphery. Um, and so the, the idea kind of looks like this. Uh, that we all know in our visual field. Um, I'm not sure what the, the background of all the attendees are, but we know by, say, properties even of the retina and by um, visual encoding precision and, and cortical magnification of different retinal locations, that vision is better in the center. It just is. Like you're the periphery of your visual field, when you're looking straight ahead, the stuff that's kind of out here, uh, it encodes information at a lower spatial resolution um, you have very few uh, cones, uh, not completely zero, but very few cones in your visual periphery, which means that your color vision is impoverished. Um, and so like this is just based on physical properties of the system. The center of your visual field is better than the periphery. Um, and typically what this means is that you uh, have higher confidence and higher like ratings of subjective visibility in the center than you do in the periphery. And this makes sense. Brains can monitor their own uncertainty, they can monitor their own noise, they can monitor their own signal quality. They know when they're doing a good job. So they know, kind of, they know that the periphery of your visual field isn't so great. However, an interesting thing happens when we start to compare the relationship between actual performance capacity, so the ability to resolve a, a physical visual stimulus, and your feeling of subjective confidence or subjective visibility that you've done a good job in that uh, determination. And it turns out that we feel like we see more than we actually can in the visual periphery. And this happens especially when we're not paying attention to the visual periphery. So a nice example of this is that if you're just kind of paying attention to something in the center, um, like a person's face, uh, and you're not paying attention to the visual periphery, you, you don't even notice that you don't see color in the visual periphery. You have this very like strong subjective sense that the world looks a lot more like this than it does like this, even though this is actually what's physically being encoded. Um, and, and this works for color. It also works for detection. And I'll go through a couple examples of this. Um, but it, it shows you that um, the way that you evaluate the quality of your visual information in the center of your visual field and the way you evaluate the quality of your, your visual information in the periphery of your visual field, there are different mechanisms at play, or at least different inputs to those mechanisms that interact in really interesting ways. And we can use this to drive out what the computation's neural processes are that give rise to both your ability to resolve visual information and your ability to judge whether you've done a good job or to rate some other subjective aspect of that stimulus like its subjective strength. So peripheral inflation offers us a really fantastic opportunity to study how performance, which is presumably what's happening based on first order properties of, uh, or properties of a first order representation, like the quality of the encoding in visual or auditory cortex, and the subjective sense of confidence or visibility that, that might arise uh, from that. Um, and this can inform the first order and higher order theory debate. So we're going to use this as our workhorse. And we're not, of course, the first ones to do this. We, we pulled all this stuff from the literature, and this is why we think it's so exciting to be able to use this. So this is a study that is now, what, 12 years old, which is kind of crazy, um, where uh, the, the, this was one of the first ones um, to 
uh, to identify peripheral uh, inflation under inattention. So they show a cue um, and they, they say like, pay attention to you know something that might happen in these two corners or these two corners. And then they show a target that is either a grating or noise or like a grating embedded in different types of noise. And they ask, you know, discriminate the orientation of the target um, and uh, or detect the target. Okay, and then they have like a response cue, which is like, I'm going to say, uh, you need to respond at the place where I, um, where I told you to attend, or sometimes the response cue was was invalid, okay, or uncued. Um, and so what they found is that um, uh, you actually, uh, and then they they titrate. Sorry, important distinction here. They titrate um, the uh, the. Oops, right. Okay, so in this experiment, let's let's have a look at this one first. Um, in this case, they're uh, titrating the visibility of the cued and uncued, or titrating the contrast actually of the cued and uncued not visibility um, uh, Gabor patches to be um, approximately equivalent. Um, and so the idea here uh, is that if I uh, change the contrast of the Gabor patch that I'm eventually going to cue. Uh, separately from the one that I'm eventually going to not cue, I can make it so that you are equivalently good at telling what the thing is in the location. Um, and then I can have a look at having held presumably the signal to noise ratio in the first order representation constant, then I can look at maybe what's happening to visibility judgments and subjective strength. And so this is exactly what Dobie did. And he found that having titrated the contrast such that uh, performance was matched between cued and uncued. There is no difference here. That subjective ratings of visibility of the stimulus were significantly higher in the uncued case. Uh, and so that this means that there is something else going on over and above uh, the strength, the signal to noise ratio in the first order representation that is leading to uh, a, a subjective sense of uh, the stimulus being out there in the world. And we can also see this kind of thing in the criterion, so this is a signal detection measure. D prime measures sensitivity. Criterion measures response bias or detection bias, um, and you can see that the the bias was was significantly different between cued and uncued, despite matched or nearly matched performance. And so this again suggests that uh, we are more liberal in detecting stuff out there in our visual periphery, especially when we're not paying attention. Uh, and this could be related to our inflated sense of awareness and of confidence in this peripheral location. Okay, and then there was a follow-up study in 2018 uh, by Lee and colleagues, um, and Brian Odegaard is uh, the senior author on this paper, and uh, they, they did a much more naturalistic task. So one, one of the criticisms of this task was like, great, cute, Gabor patches, like what does this have to do with the real world? Is this really a thing or is this just a crazy thing that you induced in the lab? And so they did this really nice study where they're using a, a virtual reality or like kind of video game environment, not like a headset VR, but it was, you know, 3D on a screen, little driving game. And um, <clears throat> they have an attentional cue, which is pay attention to stuff that happens on one side of the screen or the other. Um, and then a target shows up, which is like this little guy here or this little guy here. And that target is wearing a colored shirt of some kind. Um, and then... Uh, they um, and then they have a response cue, which is um, either uh, valid or invalid, right? So either respond to the same guy that we told you to pay attention to or not, um, and then rate your confidence. And you have to say what color was the shirt that the guy was wearing. So this is now a color detection task in the visual periphery, and the location of these um, is controlled to be like truly peripheral here. So you know you've got um, you know paying attention in the center and so on. And what they found is initially it kind of looks like, oh, well, you know, valid, sorry, you've got this um, percent correct responses for valid versus baseline versus invalid. And although this is not significant, you might be like, oh, well, maybe it kind of looks like there's something going on there. But uh, when you correct for response bias, um, you see that there are no significant differences. Uh, between a valid um, and invalid cues in terms of your ability to do the task. Uh, in this yes, no detection, kind of was it um, yellow or not, or red or not. But you see the significant difference once again in the criterion. So once again, we're seeing that under inattention, um, there is something different about how kind of willing you are to include information 
uh, that is coming in and how reliable you judge that information to be or how strong you judge that information to be, which informs your phenomenal percept. Okay, great. So this is our workhorse. This is our paradigm. Uh, that subjective inflation in the visual periphery, especially under inattention, supports the idea that it is possible to pull apart objective performance and subjective awareness. Um, and so this suggests that if objective performance is truly based on uh, the strength and signal to noise ratio in a first order local recurrency kinds of representations, um, this suggests that maybe there's something that first order local recurrency theories have, are going to have difficulty explaining that we can have cases where for all intents and purposes, your first order uh, representation is clamped. It's the same. Uh, and yet your subjective experience differs. And so that's, that's kind of in support, at least in theory of higher order theories. Um, but, um, you know, I've shown you just a couple studies uh, and there have been a few more. Um, but really what we want to do is we need to drill down. We need to go measure things like the signal to noise ratio in the first order representation. We need to go measure the strength of the first order representation. We need to use neuroimaging to make sure that no matter what we do, that first order representation is truly clamped if, um, if uh, subjective experience is still changing, then maybe higher order theories are onto something. Okay, so let's find out. Um, and so I'm going to show you now some, uh, periodically throughout the rest of the talk, some screenshots that are actually from our pre-registration. So these are things that are out there in the world. You can find them on the OSF site. Um, and uh, they are um, statements that the theory leaders of first order and higher order theories have signed off on, basically. They've put their stamp of approval. So our question for this project is, what is the relationship between first order signals and subjective perceptual strength? If you're a first order theorist, uh, you, you predict that these should not be dissociable, that these appearance, this appearance of clamped first order representation and fluctuating subjective experience, like you didn't actually clamp the first order representation. You didn't actually hold it constant. Even the performance was constant, there's still something going on down there that can explain these fluctuations in perceptual experience. <clears throat> and of course, higher order uh, theories will say no, like even if um, even if we show that we can hold that constant, there's still going to be like movement in your in your percept. Um, and so in our project, we have uh, three different phases, essentially. Um, we're going to first look for subjective peripheral inflation under inattention, but we're going to do this in a much bigger set of psychophysics experiments, and I'll go through some of those, um, not just like one or two levels of performance, um, but uh, but like a massive psychophysics undertaking. And then we're going to pick the one from our massive battery of psychophysics experiments that has the biggest effect that we possibly can elicit. So which attentional manipulation, which stimulus type, all that stuff. And then we're going to stick that in the MRI scanner. And we're going to use that then to look for first order local recurrency signal strength um, using uh, techniques where you can actually isolate that first order recurrency from the feed forward, feed forward process. Okay, so currently we are in phase one and I will go into a little bit of detail about what the task looks like. Um, and so once again, all this is pre-registered. You can go and find all these figures on our, our pre-registration site if you'd like. Um, so the idea is this. Uh, we have a fixation cross, then you have some, some uh, inactive cues come on, and then um, one of these cues turns white for a valid uh, trial uh, or an invalid trial, or like all four of them turn white. So this basically says pay attention to the thing that's being indicated by the cues. Then they all turn off for a second, and then test stimuli come up. And the test stimuli looks like this. Um, it's it's kind of small, I know, but we have this little zoom in here. So you have like this shows up during the queue period. It's just a bunch of randomly oriented little lines on the screen. And the idea here is that then there will be no, um, no abrupt change in the luminance of the screen between this and when the queues appear. So we won't have pupillary restriction and other stuff that could be confounding our signal. So then the four uh, stimuli show up and it's these four quadrants and inside each quadrant, there is this thing called a figure ground stimulus. And you can kind of see this oval here that's oriented in a horizontal orientation, or it could be vertical. 
And the uh, strength of the percept, the su subjective strength of seeing this oval is modulated by how long we make these little lines. So we make the lines longer. You can actually even see it in this, um, in this uh, tiny version here. You can see that there's a vertical oval. But when we make uh, the lines really super short, you can't see anything at all. Um, but you can still see stuff. You just can't see the oval, which is the target. Um, and then we asked people to respond, was the oval vertical or horizontally oriented? And uh, how well did you see it? How well did it pop out from the background? A kind of a measure of subjective strength on three different levels. Okay, so we can say, I saw the figure and I saw its shape. I definitely like, I, I could see the horizontal oval. I saw a figure, but I couldn't tell whether it was oriented vertical or horizontal. But if you make me guess, I guess I'll pick vertical. Um, and so this, this comes out because sometimes you're like, I, I definitely saw a thing there. It looked kind of like a circle. I don't know whether it was vertical or horizontal. Um, and so we wanted to capture those effects as well. Um, and then I didn't really see anything at all. Okay, great. So then we do this under three attentional manipulations, attention plus, attention minus. So cued, uncued, neutral, and at a whole bunch of different figure strengths so that we get a whole range of performances, not just one or two performance levels, but a whole range of performances at all of these attentional manipulations. And the idea there is that um, we don't wanna just say, oh, performance was matched uh, because I didn't find any significant differences between condition A and condition B. I don't wanna depend on a null statistical result to say that something was actually matched. That's like exactly what you teach people not to do in like intro stats, right? So what we're gonna do instead is all of these and then we're gonna to, uh, build relationships between performance and subjective awareness. And I'll show you that on the next slide. But just to sum up the, the overall design of this particular study, this is pre-registered. It is actually also simultaneously replicated at two different sites between UC Irvine and Boston University. So Rachel's group over at Boston University is running exactly the same code, um, but on their setup so that there are no, any idiosyncratic differences between the two sites should not be kind of the reason that this works. Um, and this is going to be a large data set. I know 15 subjects per site doesn't sound like a lot, but each one does six hours. Uh, and that's 30 subjects across. Now we have six experiments um, of this version. So this is just experiment one. Um, we have six of them. And so we're going to have a massive, massive data set uh, when we're all done with this that is all going to be simultaneously replicated and all the data are intended to be shared. So we hope that this is going to be a useful thing for other people who want to go messing around with the data as well. Um, and all of the experiment code is also intended to be shared as well. So you could even tweak it and run your own. Yeah, so this is one of six experiments. And that's before we even get to the MRI. Okay, so then we pick the best one um, and then we put it in the scanner. And the reason that we have all of those different subjective strengths, so I mentioned all of this, right? The reason we have all of these different subjective stimulus strengths is that we want to be able to get relationships that look like this. So on the x-axis, we have stimulus strength. Um, so line length on the y-axis, we have um, probability of being correct. And we expect to see something like this, that you're more correct under high attention than low attention. This is kind of exactly what you would anticipate. Um, and we also expect to see something like this, that uh, as stimulus strength rises, you are more likely to say that you saw the thing or that it was clearly visible. But now the critical analysis is whether the relationship between stimulus strength and percent correct is basically exactly the same as the relationship between stimulus strength and high visibility or visibility judgments in general. Because if you're a first order local recurrency theorist, they should be the same. You should be able to say, okay, as I go up along pro probability of being correct, there is a, a perfect relationship, a perfectly explainable relationship between when, when I'm going to say high visibility. So more correctness, higher visibility, attention should do the same thing, the end, okay? So we should see something that looks like this if I plot the y-axis um, from this uh, plot and the y-axis from this plot against each other. So here now, this is this y-axis and this is this y-axis. And we should say, um, if this in this performance versus awareness curve, if there is no inflation, no subjective inflation due to inattention in the visual periphery, all of these things should be overlapping. That there should be no difference in your uh, visibility ratings that is not explainable by fluctuations in your probability of being correct. 
Okay. Hope that makes sense. Um, the uh, alternative hypothesis is that we will see differences. Um, and in particular, we will see differences in this cartoon example that are uh, mapping onto the previous literature that I showed, which is that uh, for a given probability of being correct, that's fixed. So that would be like if I'm drawing a vertical line right here, you have higher visibility ratings under inattention than under attention. Okay, so we should see that uh, if I have titrated my stimuli correctly, such that I, you are exactly the same in your ability to do the task, um, but then when you're not paying attention, you should have higher visibility ratings, just like we saw back uh, here, right? Match performance, different visibility. Um, but now we're going to do it. Um, now we're going to do it across an entire range of probability of being correct, okay? And so this is what we're calling performance relative subjective inflation. Great. Okay, so we finished one of these studies already. Um, and now I'm going to show you the results. And the results are this. Ta-da! Performance relative subjective inflation. And this is highly significant. And so here I'm just showing if I take like the area under each of these curves, um, I just do an integral from bottom to top of each of these. Uh, and I do that for every single subject and then I throw it into an ANOVA. I get exactly the effect that we were looking for. And this is highly significant. There are no site-specific differences. There's no interactions with site in the omnibus ANOVA. Um, so we're really excited about this. And we were especially excited because we weren't allowed to look at the data while we were collecting it because of the pre-registration and simultaneous replication process. So we did all this piloting to make sure that you know stimulus strength influenced percent correct and we didn't screw up the you know button press coding and all of that stuff. And then we both, both sites went and collected six hours of data per person on 15 people, and we couldn't look at it until we were done. And then we, when we pressed go and we saw this, it was big celebration because this is, this is very exciting. This is only the first experiment, but it does show that when attention reduces performance, it doesn't reduce awareness by the same amount. Okay, so this does suggest that there is something additional going on, some additional computation or something that we're not measuring quite right, maybe, um, that explains uh, performance separately from awareness. So we found subjective inflation behaviorally. For the same first order signal to noise ratio, the same performance, uh, subjective strength was higher under inattention. And so the implications for this first order versus higher order theories are as follows. And now I'm going to show you a prediction table that is from the pre-registration. So these are the, the prediction tables that the theory leaders must sign off on. You can ignore the absolute subjective inflation predictions here for a second because I'm not focusing on those. We weren't really expecting to find those as well. Just focus on the performance relative subjective inflation for a second. Notice that the first order theorists found or suggested that their theory would be challenged if we found performance relative subjective inflation in at least one experiment. And in the first one, we found it. The very first one, we found it. Um, so now we have more. Now we're going to do it again, but we're going to crank up the visibility of all of the stimuli, but just make the task harder. So instead of the ovals being like this, we're going to make them fatter, so they're harder to discriminate. Um, so everything will be above threshold now in terms of detection. Then we're going to do it with Gabor patches, because previously it's been done with Gabor patches. Um, and so we want to be able to tie this back to the literature in terms of looking at the magnitude of the effect. And then we're going to do even more experiments, taking uh, either the detection or the discrimination version of each of these and using, instead of a queuing task, uh, we're going to use um, a rapid serial visual presentation central task where you have to find a target and a rapid stream of stuff that's happening in the center of your visual field. Um, and we'll make that task harder or easier to manipulate attention. And then after we are done with all of that, we stick it in the scanner. Uh, and the idea is that whichever one of these creates the biggest effect size, the biggest difference between the red and the green and the black bars, uh, that's the one that we put in the scanner. And then we can use a trick where you can, with these figure ground stimuli, you can subtract off signals in retinotopically mapped primary visual cortex from uh, trials in which there was no oval present um, from trials in which there was an oval present. So you do this subtraction. And the only difference between those trials is the fact that the oval was present based on these oriented line um, 
uh, differences between the figure and the ground. But because there's no contour, there's no other luminous differences between these, what you're left with is the first order local recurrency signal. So we can actually measure that local recurrency signal strength on uh, and, and all of these conditions. And then we can say, is that the thing that happens to be fluctuating trial by trial? Uh, and that under inattention, it's actually fluctuating in a way that um, you, would you would explain these visibility judgments. So we're going to basically do this. We're going to say, instead of performance, we're going to put first order recurrency strength on, uh, on the x-axis. And we're going to ask for the same first order recurrency strength, is visibility different? And that will be a critical test of first order uh, local recurrency theories. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, in my last few minutes here, I know we got started a little bit late, so I'm going to take just a few minutes to show you a bigger picture that's not just this project. Sorry, I'm still drinking my coffee this morning. So um, uh, this is part of the bigger picture here, and this is one of you know a series of projects that we now have going where we're trying to understand uh, using not only peripheral vision, but other kinds of stimulus manipulations um, and other kinds of reports of subjective uh, assessments of the stimulus. So not just visibility, but also confidence ratings, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, we can monitor ourselves. Um, so uh, some of the ongoing work in the lab, um, in addition to this adversarial collaboration, which is testing these first order and higher order theories, uh, we're going to look more in the visual field more generally and trying to build some computational models of why, uh, even without attentional manipulations, you might get uh, peripheral inflation. And then we'll use the attentional manipulations as critical tests of these theories. So one of these projects is a paper that we published a couple of years ago now. Um, and I'll highlight that uh, Jarrett was an undergrad when he did this work. And so that's really super cool. And I think that it's like I like to brag about his skills because he was he was great. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we uh, observed that the brain is sensitive to statistical regularities in the environment, as I said. Um, and usually when you measure these natural scene statistics, you're measuring uh, properties of the world uh, in terms of um, in terms of like a, a single property, like where does light come from or what is the orientation of this stimulus um, uh, uh, or this contour. Um, but here, what we did is we suggested that the brain is constantly building empirical priors like these about the uh, most likely state of the world, absent any incoming information, but it's doing that about noise. And it's doing that about noise as a function of visual field. So your brain has kind of learned that in the center of your visual field, if this is a distribution of the likely noise that you will experience, it's smaller in the center of your field than it is in the visual periphery. You have like a, a larger amount of noise in the periphery of your visual field because it's noisier, because you you know don't have as many, like it, just because of the properties of the retina, right? Um, and, and it's also positively skewed because noise cannot be negative. So we asked in this project, um, if the brain knows that noise is bigger in the visual periphery, but it doesn't know that it's positively skewed. It only knows that it's bigger, that its expectations about noise might look like this. And then we asked, is this error in expectations about noise enough to explain peripheral inflation? We did a whole bunch of simulations. This was a pandemic project, basically. So we couldn't collect any data um, that was precise enough to do this. This is not something that you can really do online. Um, and uh, and so if, if you want to see the, the details of that paper, um, and the models that we found, we found a model that can explain peripheral subjective inflation and that uh, uh, predicts that peripheral subjective inflation gets stronger under inattention. And we tested five different models and this was the only one that did it. Um, and so uh, this suggests to us that the system may have this kind of erroneous encoding of noise expectations. Um, we're also, so this is Angela and she's um, a, PhD student in my lab right now, and she's going to be presenting this work at VSS in May and at ASSC in June. So if any of you will be around, you can come and talk to her about that. She's interested in measuring the relationship between perception and meta-awareness. So this is basically the plots that I've been showing you all along, performance versus awareness or confidence, right? But she's interested in doing it all around the visual field, not just center versus periphery, but actually critically measuring whether vertical versus horizontal meridian makes a difference. 
Uh, and the reasoning behind this is that we know that um, performance is not just better in the center than it is in the periphery, that there's actually this kind of heart-shaped performance field. Um, and so we're going to be critically measuring under a ton of different stimulus manipulations, um, uh, the relationship between perceptual performance capacity, reaction time, confidence, judgments, all sorts of stuff. This is another one of those eight hours per person psychophysics experiment. So Angela has been very intrepid um, and I won't show you any uh, results just yet, but uh, so far they are encouraging next. Um, and then finally, I'll point out that you can do this not just with visual field location, but you can also like fiddle around with the actual stimulus properties and do this. So peripheral in inflation is just maybe one form of subjective inflation. Um, and you can induce subjective inflation, performance relative subjective inflation, just by fiddling around, messing around with the stimulus properties themselves. So um, in this experiment, uh, we had full field random dot kinematograms. These are dots that looks like a snowstorm kind of all over your screen. Um, and in uh, in one uh, location, either to the left or to the right of the fixation cross on every trial, some of the dots would move coherently downward like a little waterfall. I mean, we can manipulate the coherence of the moving little waterfall dots, make it harder or easier for you to tell which side that waterfall was on um, and rate your confidence. Um, and then we can also manipulate and this was the critical manipulation, the amount of stuff on the screen. So we can have low density, which is like this snowstorm is like flurries. Um, and then we can have high density, which is like it's a crazy blizzard. Okay. And so we can do that in a blocks design or every single trial. We change the density of the dots and we can see how that might change the relationship between performance and awareness or confidence judgments, subjective confidence ratings. Um, and so this paper actually was one of the first ones where we started using the full meta-perceptual function, this full relationship between lots of different performance levels and confidence um, or visibility judgments. And what we found, if it'll come up, is that in the blocks design, we didn't find any performance relative subjective inflation, but we certainly did in the interleave design. So you can see that these lines start to come apart and that high density leads to higher confidence ratings relative to your whatever fixed performance capacity you want to, to um, have. Okay, so, um, and then we also have some neuroimaging studies and some modeling studies, and I know that um, we don't have really time to go into that today. Um, but you may have noticed as I'm talking throughout um, this, uh, this work, and these are my last few slides, I know, <laughs> um, that I'm kind of using confidence and awareness and subjective experience all like interchangeably. Um, and Axel Clearmans, who I, I know you've already heard from, has a nice paper from uh, over 10 years ago now where he basically is saying, no, they're not the same thing and we can't treat them as the same thing. And there's lots of people who have written theory papers about that as well. Um, so I wanted to, to uh, address the elephant in the room and say that I am not saying they are the same thing, um, but I'm really interested in studying both and I'm really interested also in studying metacognition specifically um, because I think that metacognition gives us something that pure visibility judgments, pure, pure judgments of subjective strength don't. Um, and that is because metacognition um, really, uh, it, it drives at specific properties of the signal to noise ratio and the shape and dimensionality of the first order representation that you may not be able to get from just subjective visibility alone. So I wanted to, at the very end here, um, try to, to give you a, a theoretical argument. And this is the Cliff Notes version. If you'd like to read 50 pages of me rambling about this, you can go and check that out. Um, but uh, metacognition has, I'm just gonna put all these up on the screen, a lot of properties that I think are really valuable when we're trying to study subjective awareness. Um, and these are properties that make metacognition special over and above just a visibility rating, as I said. So, um, you know, we've talked about this, confidence is a higher order representation. Essentially, it's about internal representations. Um, we might have higher order upon higher order upon higher order, like evaluation of evaluation, that kind of thing. Um, but then in addition to those links to higher order theories of consciousness, we can also note that there is something that it's like to feel sure. It has subjective um, qualia. Right, So it's not just a subjective strength about a visual percept, there's also something that it is like to be sure 
in your decisions. And you can translate this into a common currency and translate it across modalities and across decisions. And you know, you can kind of get at what is the pure uh, subjective phenomenological feeling of feeling sure in a decision over and above the properties about of the decision that you're making. So over and above the brightness of the stimulus or the loudness of an auditory thing or whatever, like the subjective quality of feeling sure might be this pure kind of amodal thing. We could get at that and that would be very valuable because um, then we could knock out all the theories that say, oh, you know, metacognition and subjective awareness just supervenes on the, the first order properties of the stimulus about which you're making a decision. So this is very nice. And then also metacognition has these really nice practical properties, which is we can write down math. We can write down lots of math um, that allows us to relate properties of the first order local uh, recurrency or otherwise representation and use them to drive inputs to mathematical models that must, by definition, be extremely precise in order to be able to, to capture the subjective feeling of confidence across a wide variety of domains. And so just to give you an idea of what this system looks like, you know, you have a stimulus out there in the world, and then you have an internal first order representation, you read that out as some sort of decision estimate. And then what stuff about this, and we don't even know what that stuff is, gets fed into some additional, um, additional equation, additional function, if you will. Um, and then you form this higher order representation, one output of which is metacognition, if you have a decision policy right here. But there are lots of other decision policies that you could apply. And so if we can get this whole thing right, we're going to do a really much more precise job of understanding how it is to create the subjective feeling of metacognition and consciousness, or metacognition and confidence, sorry, uh, which might give us a handle on how at least one subjective type of experience is formulated to begin with. Okay, and so this allows us to change the question that I posed at the beginning, which was, you know, how do you become phenomenally aware? Well, I think that we need to change it to how can we best study phenomenal awareness and the adversarial collaborations that I've shown you today. Some of the psychophysics we're doing, I think, answers part of that question. But also we need to build these practical approaches that uh, allow us to make quantifi quantifiable and falsifiable um, and unique predictions about the relationship between first order representations, stimulus properties in the world, and our subjective experiences of them that may not always go hand in hand. Okay. All right. So you are conscious. We've got a lot of theories uh, that uh, proliferate and um, make us think that we're kind of onto something maybe, um, but I want to throw my own uh, glove into the ring and say that I think that metacognition specifically beyond just higher order theories in general, that metacognition has some of these really nice properties um, that will allow us to build generative explanations. And if you're not familiar with generative explanations of phenomenal experiences, I think this quote by Lisa Meraki uh, really sums it up nicely. Um, you know, explaining the difference between causal explanations, which is I crank this knob and I change your percept in a particular way. Um, but a generative explanation is, is exploring how a new natural kind um, can, can emerge from a previous natural kind, which is really ultimately what we're trying to do when we're solving like the hard problem of consciousness, right? We don't want to just build a causal a causal model and say, okay, if I poke this spot in your brain, then you become more conscious. That's not going to be satisfactory. What we want to do is we want to understand why that is. So metacognition and the models we can build about it, I think, take us one step in that direction. All right. So we've got a lot of work to do. I hope that some of you in this room will join us um, and, and continue on this work. We've, we really have a lot to do here. Um, we need to do basically an entire new uh, psychophysics of metacognition, just like we did, you know, the past 80 years of psychophysics of like, you know, stuff that's out there in the world. Um, I think we need a whole new psychophysics of metacognition. And, um, and I think we need smart people working on it, like you go, you all. So um, I, uh, I hope that um, this has been entertaining, especially after the dance party. Um, if any of you will be at VSS in May or ASSC in June, um, please come say hi. I also will be at CCN uh, in August in Oxford, which might be a little bit easier for some people to get to, um, not in the United States. Uh, and um, so I want to 
thank all of the people I, I talked about some people today, but really like all of this work is a massive collective effort among a ton of people. And I'm super grateful. This is an old picture of my lab, new picture of my lab last year at CCN, all of the funding sources. And thank you for your attention.